Hi, welcome. Thank you for coming. This is our, our last event of this year, and we're very grateful for your attendance throughout. Tonight, I'm very excited because I think it was about, probably about 13 years ago, 12 or 13 years ago, I started reading some stories of Juno Diaz as they were published around. And then 11 years ago, his book Drown came out, and I was so excited. It's a book of, it's a book of stories, but they're somewhat interconnected, and they just were, they were both traditional and completely fresh and completely, the language was just intensely infused with all kinds of, all kinds of new, new words, new phrases, new, new vernacular that I hadn't heard before, and it was so exciting. And sometimes that happens, and you, you read a book, and you teach a book, and, and your enthusiasm wears out. But I found over the years, I just never wore out on these stories. And being sort of a slow writer myself, I never particularly noticed the fact that, that another book didn't rapidly follow. But all of a sudden, this year, the novel came. And what a novel. It, it, was worth, it was worth the wait. And you can see why. I, don't, I, I haven't asked Juno Diaz yet. I just met him today. But I haven't had a chance to ask him whether he was working on it all those 11 years. But I'll tell you, my guess is he was. It was absolute, it's such a layered and, and complicated and, and full piece. But it's also full of fun and full of joy and full of music and, and lingo and, and everything packed and good. So I, w I won't hesitate any longer, but I want to introduce with great pleasure Juno Diaz. Thank you, Mona. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys, for coming out today. Uh, I wanted to thank UCLA, of course, of course, as my uh, my uh, my host and Hammer for having me here. Yeah, it's the first time I've been here, and it's like really a nice spread. Yeah, it's like kind of beautiful. Y'all been having an art revival here the last ten years, no? Yeah, just kind of was like the Miami of the. The West Coast, <laughs> y'all changed tremendously. <laughs> you know? So it's really nice to see. Yeah, I also heard that the weather has been fucked up before I came. Is this, are this rumors true? Is this true? Was it raining here or something? It was windy. Well, no, I, I knew something was up because I have a, a I have good friends here, and they were I've never heard them complain about the wedding, wet weather, so they've been complaining. Yeah, okay. And uh, did y'all are y'all aware weathering our uh, election process out here? Hmm. Well, who did you guys vote for? Huh? But I'm saying, who took it though? Who took? It was Hillary. Come on, man. What the hell's going on with you folks? <laughs> Damn. Didn't Texas vote for Hillary too? It's all right. New Jersey did too, I think. My beloved, fucked up state. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. No. I actually. Come on, guys. You know how it is. It's like we're in this bizarre situation where. If uh, if if a Republican wins again, yeah, you know, they're gonna ship. You're gonna wake up in a camp somewhere with a number. I promise you. <laughs> uh, so all right, we'll see how it works. Yeah. Um, it's sort of strange. I have an old friend of mine here, and and uh, one of the things about this book, uh, which I'm gonna read just pieces of, was that this was a a very very long sort of tortured process. Um, uh, it's interesting that a friend of mine is here, Romero Derpino, he sort of saw the book from its, uh, from its inception. Uh, he was the one who gave me the idea of sort of setting the U.S. parts of it in Patterson, where he was from. 
Yeah. But I always wondered what it looks like to someone else because, uh, you know, when I started this, there was barely a germ. You know, now the book is done, of course. It's easy to pretend that you've had this all in your mind the whole time. You know, but I, 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 I certainly wasn't sure that anything would come of this, having failed a number of attempts to write other books during this process. And, uh, and it's really weird. Every time I see my friend Olmedo, I always think, like, Jesus, you know, you really did see it when, when it was just barely Patterson, some kind of a curse, and a fat kid. That was all there was. You know? So, strange. It's good to see him. Good to be reminded that these are often extremely arduous processes, you know? Um, some books get written with sort of a lovely ease, and other books it feels like. Do you remember those, uh, those lead bars that they use, you know, when they used to crucify you? And they would use the leg bars to break, the big lead iron bars to break your leg bones? Anyway, you should read the Bible. So, I honestly felt like they were taking these big metal bars to like every single one of my creative bones every month. So, it's good to get this thing done. All right. I feel like I've spent about half the time now just chatting, which makes for good. I'm just going to read a very small piece and then call it a day. Um, take some questions. Yeah? Okay. Is there a... Just... Um, I'm going to fuck up. I was sort of really going to read the end of it. So I'm sorry. If you haven't read it. Yeah. Fuck. You know? The other thing is, I know I got an email the other day. Are there some of y'all out here who are going to, who want to ask a question but are not going to ask me because they're like, they hate speaking in public or something? Do you want to raise your hand if you're like, not, you're going to, you want to ask a question but you're not really going to ask it? Because either I'm a jerk or you're afraid of people. Is that one person happily to tell me that? Are you the only person? God, you guys are amazing. Okay, so we will call on you first. Yeah. Uh, so. Really? You guys suck. So what I'll do is um, then, here, first we'll just read a... I'll read to you a little footnote while I scheme on what else I'm going to read. All right? Okay, and here we go. Yeah, this is from a footnote um, uh, in the book. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the writer Patrick Chamoiseau, right? Is that the way I pronounce it? Wrote Texaco, Solibo, The Magnificent. If you're familiar with his work, you'll know where I stole all the footnoting from. You know, not just the technique, but also how and why he does it. Yeah? That's very different from other people. So this is just a footnote in the book, and it goes like this. I lived in Santo Domingo until I was nine, and even I knew criadas. Two of them lived in the callejón behind our house, and these girls were the most demolished, overworked human beings I had known at the time. One of them, Sobeda, did all the cooking, all the cleaning, fetched all the water, and took care of two infants for a family of eight. And the chickie was only seven years old. She never went to school, and if my brother's first girlfriend, Johanna, hadn't taken the time to teach her her ABCs, she wouldn't have known nothing. Every year that I came back from the States, it was the same thing. Quiet, hard-working Sobeda would stop in our place, stop by our place for a second, to say a word to my abuelo and my mother before running off to finish her next chore. I tried to talk to her, of course, Mr. Community Activist, but she would skitter away from me and my stupid questions. My mother demanded, what can the two of you talk about? That pobrecita cannot even spell her own name. And then when Sobeda was 15, one of the Callejon idiots knocked her up, and now my mother tells me the family has got her kid working for them too, bringing in water for his mother. Yeah? Okay, that's one.
Okay, since I've been denied the ending. How bold, you guys. How bold. I always feel like you, you should obey the initial request if it's, if it's considered and um, not kind of like wildly irrational. Yeah? Um, so even though I know I, sh I shouldn't listen, the, the, the first was, it was, a, it was a, a decent request. It wasn't like, you know. Yeah, well, that would probably be more, even more well considered. Yeah? So, all right. Uh, I'm stuck reading something I always read. So don't worry, just pretend, okay? Um, here we go. It's just a piece called Wildwood. It's never the changes we want that change everything. This is how it all starts. With your mother calling you into the bathroom. You will remember what you were doing at that precise moment for the rest of your life. You were reading Watership Down and the rabbits were making their dash for the boat and you did not want to stop reading. But then your mother called again louder, her I am not fucking around voice. And you mumbled irritably, si, sí, senora. She was standing in front of the medicine cabinet mirror, naked from the waist up, her bra slung around her like a torn sail, the scar on her back as vast and inconsolable as a sea. You want to return to your book to pretend that you hadn't heard her, but it is too late. Her eyes meet yours, the same big smoky eyes that you will have in the future. Ven acá, she commands. She is frowning at something on one of her breasts. For the record, your mother's breasts are immensities, one of the wonders of the world. The only ones that you've seen that are bigger are on really in nudie magazines or on really, really fat ladies. There are 35 triple Ds and the Oreolas are as big as saucers and as black as pitch. And at their edges are fierce little hairs that sometimes your mother plucks and sometimes she does not. These breasts have always embarrassed you, and when you walk in public with her, you are always conscious of them. After her face and her chair, her face and her hair, her chest is what she is most proud of. Your father, she likes to brag, could never get enough of these. But given the fact that he ran off on her after the third year in marriage, it seemed in the end that he could, yeah? You dread conversations with your mother, these one-sided dressing downs. You figured that she has called you in to give you another earful about your diet. Your mother is convinced that if you eat more platanos, you will suddenly acquire her same extraordinary train-wrecking secondary sex characteristics. Even at that age, you were nothing if not your mother's daughter. You were 12 years old and already as tall as she was a long, slender-necked ibis of a girl. You had her green eyes, clearer though, and her straight hair, which makes you look more Hindu than Dominican, and a behind that the boys have not been able to stop talking about since the fifth grade, but whose appeal you do not yet understand. You have her complexion too, which means that you are dark, but for all your similarities, the tides of inheritance have yet to reach your chest. You have only the slightest hint of breast. From most angles, you are flat as a board. And you are thinking that your mother is going to order you to stop wearing bras again because they are suffocating your potential breasts, <laughs> discouraging them from developing, yeah? You are ready to argue with your mother to the death because you are as possessive of your bras as you are of the pads you now buy yourself. But no, your mother says nothing to you about eating more platanos. Instead, she takes your right hand and guides you. Your mother is rough in all things, but this time she is gentle. You did not think her capable of it. Do you feel that? She asks. At first, all you feel is the heat of her and the density of the tissue, like a bread that has never stopped rising. She kneads your fingers into her. 
You're as close as you've ever been, and your breathing is what you hear. Don't you feel that? she asks. She turns towards you. Coño, muchacha del diablo, stop looking at me and feel. So you close your eyes and your fingers are pushing down on her. And of course, you're thinking of Helen Keller and how when you were little, you wanted to be just like Helen Keller, except a little more nunnish, yeah? And then suddenly, without warning, you do feel something, a knot just beneath her skin, tight and secretive as a plot. And at that moment, for reasons you will never quite understand, you are overcome by the feeling, the premonition, that something in your life is about to change. You become lightheaded, and you can feel a throbbing in your blood, a beat, a rhythm. Bright lights zoom through you like photon torpedoes, like comets. You do not know how or why you know this thing, but that you know it cannot be doubted. It is exhilarating. For as long as you have been alive, you have had bruja ways. Even your mother will begrudge you that much. Hija de Liborio, she called you after you picked your Diaz winning lottery number for her. And you assumed that Liborio was a relative. That was before Santo Domingo, before you knew about the great power of God. I feel it, you say suddenly. Lo siento. And like that, everything changes. Before the winter is out, the doctors remove that breast that you were needing along with the axillary lymph node. Because of the operation, your mother will have trouble lifting her arm over her head for the rest of her life. Her hair begins to fall out, and one day she pulls all the rest of it out herself and puts it inside a plastic bag. You change too, not right away, but it happens, and it is in that bathroom where it all begins where you begin. Okay, that's it. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, I think we're done. Uh, now we're doing a, a second component. Yeah, Madame? was nice enough to talk to my class and he was talking about obsessions and one of the obsessions that you were talking about being in the in the lure of now was reading critical writing about about genre writing and I wondered how these these obsessive reading jags play into your work and whether they helped you at all with this book? So, uh, yeah, it's kind of embarrassing. You talk to the class, and then... And then... Then your, your host throws you under the bus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, guys, I, I've been obsessively reading, like, stupidly for reasons that don't make any sense to me, like, uh, dissertations on fantasy novels. You tell me, you know. What I'm working on now has nothing to do. Oh, shit. What's up, bro? Look at the baby. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Uh, and I, I don't think it has anything to do with anything I'm going to write about. Uh, I just, I, there's something about, look, I guess in the, the academia that I'm involved in, there's probably nothing like less cool than writing your dissertation on fantasy novels. <laughs> you know, it's like guarantee like no job position unless <laughs> unless you have your like Victorian literature background really strong. And so that there's kind of this strenuous attempt to sort of the strenuous attempt to argue for like that this is worthy of of study. And I, I like love that. You know, I like love when people are like totally feel like no one gives a shit about their field and that they have to. They have to actually, like, not only make an argument for what's interesting about their books, but they're almost making an argument for why they're doing this weird thing. And, so, yeah, so I'm lame. Yeah. They care. They care. Um, can you talk about, um, you've said this was arduous, this book. Can you talk about it in comparison with 
other experiences you've had writing it? Do you think it's the novel? No. <laughs> no, no. I mean, jokes aside, it's it's strictly me. The novel form is uh, an incredibly generous form. There's plenty of people who have like little to no experience and write incredible novels. You know, um, I think it's it's far too easy to to create a, a mysticism around it. Uh, it was just me. I just some guys. Sometimes you catch a really bad one, you know, and there's a couple ways around it. You either like give it up and do something else, um, or you just keep just banging your head against it till it yields something. Um, for me, I just happened to catch a, a novel that, despite its sort of, I thought, you know, the narcissism of art. I thought, despite its elegant simplicity, you know. <laughs> I realized that I was in a lot of trouble by year four, you know? <laughs> I was like, yo, this shit is fucking a terror. <laughs> but part of it was also, I mean, look, it's weird. You write these books alone and you write them in solitude and you write them with nerdy concentration, yeah? A friend of mine was like, with Talmudic concentration, but <laughs> I was like, fuck, that's not a bad one, you know? And uh but what ends up happening is that you create organizations for this book in your head to sort of structure the experience in a weird way or structure the way you're reading it. And um, uh, there were a number of things that were happening in this book that are probably not apparent on a first, second, third, or fourth pass. But the, for me, for me, I felt like we're very important, which is usually the doom of an artist, to imagine that something that you're doing is like very, very important, and then you discover like. It's been holding you back. So I had this, uh, did you guys all read Rick Moody's The Ice Storm? No, you should read The Ice Storm. Who read The Ice Storm? Yeah? Wait, uh, say those hands again. Okay. Oh, not so many people. The, do you remember, how, how is The Ice Storm uh, uh, organized? Like, what are the four sections? Do you remember what is the operating principle? At least you didn't give away the ending, man, you know? <laughs> but definitely, I mean, those are the most striking images. But does it, do you remember how it's organized? Why it's in four parts? Does anybody remember? Fuck, man. Yeah. Well, see, this is what I mean. You get caught in this shit, and it becomes an utter irrelevant point becomes an obsession. <laughs> so what... What happened to me was that I really liked how Rick Moody organized the ice storm, where the ice storm was organized in four parts for the four family members, and that, in, in, that he was using the Fantastic Four, the comic book, to organize each of the characters. They're sort of each of the characters was like a kind of a figure from the Fantastic Four, and he didn't make it very explicit. You know, and so part of what was happening in this novel is that I, I know this seems totally insane, you guys, and it's completely not apparent, but I was organizing like the four major characters, a la Rick Moody, through the Fantastic Four. It's kind of stupid, but like I had this really big fat character who hated his body, felt like his body was his monstrous self. So I was like, okay, that's the thing, and that's Oscar, you know. I had the, the sister who was just constantly, you know, I mean, can I be more obvious, who was like constantly on fire, you know? And I kind of like described her as such, and I was like, ah, okay, that's the human torch, you know? And I had this mother who like huge parts of her lives were either, she was either completely, and the book makes it no, makes no attempt to hide it. The mother is either invisible, you know, or uh, she has these enormous force fields. So I was like, okay, invisible woman. You know, and then there was the grandfather who's this like hyper, hyper genius. And I was like, okay, Mr. Fantastic, you know, and it, like, who the fuck cares? <laughs> you know, like when you think about it, it's utterly fucking nonsense. I mean, but yet I, I just, you got stuck in these holes and it took me a long time to figure out that it was stupid. <laughs> did you work on, did you work on it since Drown or did you? Where did you start other projects? No, no, I started two novels that not a single word, uh, 
not a single word from those books made it. I had a, 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 a I went to Texas to do a reading, and a critic wrote in the uh, wrote an article, and the people, you know, when you show up to do the reading, people always like hand you shit to see what is your reaction. So I got off the plane, and dude was like, well, "Take a look at this uh, review. What do you think?" And the person reviewing it was like, you know. You know, the author clearly took parts of his failed novels <laughs> and, you know, stapled them together. Now, this book could suck ass, but I guarantee you that no parts of my failed novel are in here. <laughs> you know, my failed novel, there was people like, you know, piloting starships and eating each other. So <laughs> I promise you, not a single word. So, yeah, no, first I tried to write two really bad novels about those aforementioned subjects and then about four years into it I started this book so you're not afraid to throw things out um well I think it's the opposite I think it's I feel like my books don't mind throwing me away <laughs> you know they were just like in search of a better writer so <laughs> I think for real I think there's somebody out there with the ill cannibalism novel and <laughs> They're just a fucking genius. Um, but I'm not kidding. It's, it's all fun and games. But I, it's like broke my heart those first four years when those two books failed. You know, you're like, you put a lot of work into this shit, you know. And in your mind, you're dreaming. I thought, honestly, guys, I thought I was going to sail to, to, you know, sail away on the carpet of my starship dreams. You know, I was like, it was all going to be okay. Are you working on something new? Nope. I actually, uh, I've been trying to work on something, but um, <laughs> guys, I just said no. <laughs> you know? I'm trying to work on something new, uh, but it's, um, I think part of when you were saying uh, earlier about the reading, it doesn't have any effect. It seems that I'm trying to read across all sorts of areas because I'm trying to get, s there seems to be some material that my unconscious needs. Um, I, I, I don't know what it is exactly yet, but part of the, these, these bursts of reading, I think, have been because I'm trying to generate some sort of necessary intellectual or artistic material to, to proceed to the next point, you know? Um, and I don't know, it's, it's been very weird because your mind isn't, at least mine isn't, um, isn't so quick and willing to give me direct clues about what I should be doing next, you know? I think it wants to take you on an, a journey. And for those of us who are kind of like, you know, oriented around product, it's hard. Because, you know, I, I don't really want to take a long journey. I just want to fucking finish another book, you know? <laughs> but in the end, you've got to do what you've got to do as an artist. It's like, I have a ton of friends who write a book every two years. And I guess, like, the universe just needed somebody who writes one every, like, 11 years, you know? <laughs> and you've got to accept... I mean, shit, I wish I was every two years I could get a fucking advance, you know? But you got to accept what you get, whether you like it or not, you know? And so the, the book right now that I'm trying to work on next, every time I sit down to write a page, it, I get two sentences, and it says, you know, you don't, you really should learn about Algerian secret police organization. And I, I go out and have to read this stuff. So I haven't been able to get it started without books getting in the way work a lot in your head or do you, or do you work do you revise a lot uh, when you actually start writing or do you do you think a long time about a book and organize it no i i, I work through writing so i I've, I've this book that i said i haven't gotten anything done i've written about a hundred pages yeah and they're like you know it's just terrifying you know and uh but but it's just a hundred pages and it, it won't lead to anything but it's sort of organizing my thoughts a little bit I mean, like, guys, there. look, there's a lot of artists out here, I'm sure. There are way better ways to do this than the way that I do this. I think that in the end, you know, it's, it's you've got to figure out the way, you've got to figure out how you can get through the labyrinth. I seem to be like getting through the labyrinth only through uh, difficulty and long sort of wrestling with the subject. But believe me, this is, you know, for the young artists out there, or the artists who are working, this is, that's not the way it should always go, you know? I think a lot of people work far more easily. 
Hey, and you know what's fucking crazy is a two-year novelist, but there's actually no correlation between how long it takes you to write a book and how good it is. No, I, I know it's like, it's that's really, well, no, I mean, that's art. I mean, it's real comforting to say it takes you 11 years to write a book and that somehow means you're any fucking good. I mean, shit, like Moby Dick was written in how many months? I mean, like months. Gatsby. Yeah, oh, Gatsby. He was just Thanks. like, yeah, he just like farted that shit, you know? <laughs> that was like brilliant. So I just, I think it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's too facile to sort of link the two. I mean, I think we like to imagine that there's some sort of glory in the long suffering, but I don't believe it. I think that art stands on its own, irregardless of the, the torture or non-torture that is required to produce it. Mm -hmm. Um, who are you going to call on first from the audience? Was there that person who... Yes, the, the person who didn't want to hear the ending. We have a microphone if that person wants to raise their hand. Or oh, now Chicken Little is like, I'm gone. Points. Okay. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Under the bus. Under the bus. I, I forgot my question, so we can go to another person. <laughs> Guys, you see how I adjusted my reading for this person? <laughs> Custom would dictate that one returns the favor with the question, but all right, we'll leave it at that, madame. Arg. Good evening. Sure. Um, if you were to write about Los Angeles, besides the weather, what would you write about? It's a good question. I don't know, I don't know the city well enough, you know? I mean, I think the thing with the guys, I mean, Los Angeles is sort of like New York, is sort of like <coughs> Paris, is sort of like Havana, is sort of like Mexico City, where you could line up the books written about the city or written with the city in mind, and literally the books could take you all the way to the moon, yeah? To write about Los Angeles and to be any good at it, you've got to mess with some people who've raised the bar at a tremendous level. So given that, I mean, I... And not living here, I, I guess probably the only thing I could write about is what it would mean for someone like uh, a kid from uh, a kid from New Jersey who suddenly gets transplanted to L.A. You know, like we haven't seen that a million times. You know, <laughs> I'm not so sure what I could. Again, I, I just feel like I, I, you don't want to be like I, I myself, and it's not that that speaks to bad art, but. I feel like, I don't know, you, you don't know a place till so you're forced to, you know? And places are so dynamic. I mean, I come here once a year to visit my friends and stuff, and it's sort of like a flip book example of a, a city. In a year, things have changed so much. And, you know, I have a very kind of, s a very discreet group of friends, and they have their biases, but because that's really all I get of L.A., if I drew a cognitive map, my cognitive map about LA, it would be more about what my friend Bert doesn't like to eat, <laughs> how much my boy Omero hated his time at UCLA, you know, like where everybody likes to dance, you know. And so I guess I don't know. I just think the, the whole thing about writing about LA is whoever is writing about LA right now, y'all know you picked the, one of the hardest subjects to be good at. You know, because there's 10,000 experts in whatever area you're going to write about half Filipino, half Samoans living in L.A. There's at least 10,000 motherfuckers will tell you your shit sucks, yo. So, I mean, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. There, there, go ahead, madam. Sorry. Um, I know that. Uh, Professor Simpson teaches your work, and I know my sister who goes to Cal learned your work in a creative writing class with Vikram Chandra, and I know that you are a professor of creative writing at MIT. What do you feel about your work being held up as kind of like an example for young writers who are trying to start out? Thank you. It's a very good question. You know, part of what, again, you, I mean, those are two examples, but as you know, I mean, I, I think that... <sighs> What's really wonderful about reading is that most people, especially if they're involved in this enough to want to be writers, you read tremendously. 
So one example will neither make or break the case. Yeah. Whether your book is bad or good, useful or useless, um, it's going to go into the pot. Yeah. And even if it's being explicitly taught, a book could be explicitly taught as like, this is a useful model. That doesn't speak to the way that the unconscious organizes what's useful for the person. What I find intriguing is that what makes good artists in general, if you want to like talk in general, is that you want as much exposure to forms and as much exposure to practitioners as possible. There's plenty of people who do plenty of good art without either. But if, you know, when you're young and you're kind of banking the odds, it's sort of good to have as much material as possible in your head. And it, it's sometimes what people hold up as a good example will work for other people in their minds as a counterexample. And so I guess I don't mind. I don't look as a writer. You're, you're such a blip on the larger map of culture and that you know that even that little blip is going to go into this kind of big old stew in anybody's head anyway of all the words they've ever read. I mean, my thing is uh, there's nothing, there's probably the only reason you do this is because there's a part of you that hopes to God that that very unique worldview that you have that comes through in this book, someone will wish to engage that in a conversation longer than just the time that it takes them to finish the book if they finish it. And for me, what I would think of as being a writer, what I hope will be useful to young writers is simply that if there's any models that I've used in the book that they can use as well, that would be awesome, you know? But you know, it's, it's, it's great. It's an honor to be taught, et cetera, et cetera. But you don't, you don't want to take yourself too fucking seriously. You know, each generation's superstar ends up being the person who in the next generation never gets taken out from the library. So you should be really cautious, you know? There was a hand down here, so I was just going to, and then we'll go back all the way up to the hecklers. <laughs> for real, somebody's going to fuck with me now. Thanks for being here. Um, as a writer and a teacher of writing, uh, how do you feel about writing programs to a young artist? Is it, are they still important? Are they still valuable? Um, or have they become really similar to one another and, and in fact, get in the way of, the, of a young writer? Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, that's a really good question. You know, it's... In the U.S., there's, look, guys, we're, we deal with a country that's, like, deeply anti-intellectual, that's deeply suspicious of intellectual institutions. Honestly, like, intellectual institutions get banged on more than, say, the military. <laughs> for real. Honestly. Tomorrow, if they said they wanted an extra dollar for schools, you guys would go out and burn half the city. <laughs> Be like, No. But if they said, turn over every black youth under 22 and every Mexican slash Salvadoran slash Nicaraguan Latino youth so we continue this war, people would be like, awesome, Rock of Love is on. <laughs> you know? There's, there's like this, you know, I mean, that's of course, uh, yes, you can guess, it's a tremendous exaggeration, of course, you know, but I do think that there's, there's, there's this whole relationship we have with art and art being taught. I think for young writers, guys, any opportunity a young artist has to be exposed to other young artists and to have someone else pay for it while they do it is not bad. You know, I think that any institution can fuck you up. Um, and that certainly institutions have a way of like, you know, that thing designed by committee. Yeah, like the concept that you get 10 writers telling you what you should be doing. Usually they're going to guide you the safest route. Um, but that doesn't change anything, that if you can get an institution where you can be paid to encounter other young or interesting or just like dynamic people, it's not a bad idea. Look, just as much bad literature gets published by people who didn't go to an MFA as people who went. Don't worry about it. You know, whether you went to an MFA or not, chances are you are going to suck. You know, and being really good, I think, has very little to do with these kind of deterministic things. Again, I would argue about paying yourself $45,000 a year to go to an MFA. If I had 45 grand, I would not be paying a school to teach me how to write. 
Like that, that seems like a really weird way to lose your money, you know? But if you can get other people to pay you through, you know, through grants and stuff, that shit is dope. <laughs> but racking up $125,000 in loans, I would like go for 10 years and go live in fucking, I don't know, wherever you can live for 10 years on $125,000, you know? And look, I myself, I basically saved myself 10 years of learning by going to an MFA. I felt that like all the white kids, because I went to a predominantly white MFA, and they, most of them didn't have much good to say about my work, you know? Um, and a lot of it was some real weird, biased, racial, racial shit. There's a lot of racism in MFA programs because there's a lot of racism in all our institutions. Just because they're artists doesn't mean that they're going to be like much more tolerant, you know? But one of the things about being exposed to all these kids who were taking this work seriously is that I was able to literally... It was like an advanced master's course in everything that they had read. All these kids, everything that they had read, and all the tricks that they distilled from that reading, I was able to steal all that shit in a year. And it would have taken me a really long time to get that. You know, you learn a tremendous amount when you're facing, quote unquote, a bunch of other people doing the same thing as you. And that's hard to quantify. But again, you've got to be interested in that. You, if you're not going to an MFA to steal all the best ideas from your peers, I'm like, what the fuck are you doing there, yo? <laughs> you know? So I, I don't have a problem with them per se. I think that they're problematic because of all the general things that happen in institutions, like racism and classism and that they don't give you enough money, you know? But I do think that any single young person could find their way through an MFA, no problem. You might bitch and moan about it, but if an MFA is your biggest problem as a writer, God bless you, yo. The rest of us are just like, I hate myself. <laughs> the darkness, you know? <laughs> yeah, that hand over there. No, but you'll be next, sir. I enjoyed your reading. I have a, a small question for you. Do you consider yourself an American writer, a Dominican writer, a Latino writer, a writer of African descent, a Latino Caribbean writer of African descent? Mm. Or are you too postmodern to answer this kind of question? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, what the fuck up, man. <laughs> Me, not the question. You know? I, but look, I, I do think that these questions are incredibly valuable, not just because my thing is this, I find that the same people are desperate to quantify and categorize all the experience. Our brains are organized for this, you know? People want to define you at the speed of light. The trick is to try to figure out a way to define yourself at the speed of light to counter that kind of external definition, or at least to be in a relationship with it, you know? Um, I don't think an individual can define themselves. Um, and yet I also don't think a collective can define an individual. It's like a relationship between these two in some way. I mean, a direct answer to your question is that I feel like I'm most of those things simultaneous. And that, for example, I always feel like a Dominican writer, but I always feel like a, a writer of African descent, a Caribbean writer, a Latino writer. Um, I think that in the United States, there's this sense that if you categorize yourself as a writer, that that's somehow a limitation. Yeah? But in other words, by saying that I'm a Dominican writer, that that somehow has ghettoized me in some weird way. Which is strange, because no one says that about white writers. White writers might not actually articulate that they're white writers, but they're white writers. <laughs> I mean, they are. It's like an accident of history that the name white is not attached to writer because for the most part, it was a given historically, you know? For the most part, in the 60s and 50s and 40s and 30s and on, when you said writer, immediately, if you weren't talking about a white writer, you had to put in some caveats, you know, because that was the understood. I guess I don't think that being from a tiny place in the Caribbean at a very specific historical period um, sort of denies me the universal. In fact, I think the specificity of a Dominican experience guarantees the universal. You know, um, 
you know, I, I think it's, it's sort of weird. Think about the think about England. Guys, England is such a mutant history. If the British could imagine themselves the center of the universe, I mean, kind of absurd when you step back. I mean, and it's hard when we're in it to see it for how absurd it is. But if you think of that rabble on the North Atlantic, I mean, they were able to have imagination strong enough to imagine themselves the universe. I see there's nothing wrong with a Dominican kid who grew up in New Jersey from imagining that A, I can be 12 identity things at once, but B, that those identity things, instead of being limitations, are in fact evidence of how incredibly quote unquote universal our work is. You know, and we could argue about the universal because we know that's problematic, but I, I think that that's for me what drives me because I, I always say this again and again, all the authors that we are still talking about the only thing that they have in common is the specificity of their vision. I mean, we're always, you know, the great giants, we call them, it's their specificity that has permitted them to remain relevant today. So I would argue for a kid, you know, we're talking about the, the Filipino Samoan kid. I would be like, I promise you, 500 years from now, we'll be still reading them, and we won't be reading the kid who's like, well, no, I wanted to write universally with no specificity. I didn't want to mention the names of my neighborhood because of the streets because I didn't want people who weren't from there to feel left out. <laughs> I just don't think literature works that way. And I also don't think identity works that way. You know? I think we only have like a couple more questions. There's a young person up here, probably Um, I have a question about the book, um, but it might give away the ending. So I have a, I have a backup question. No, no, you can ask it. Those of you who don't want to hear the ending, just plug your ears and say like Obama or Hillary over and over. <laughs> At the end of the book, when Oscar is killed, mm. did he <laughs> You were warned. I, I Sir, have, I they offered, were warned. I offered Y'all were warned. You just, you're the guys who were like, will look up. Anyway, you were warned. Um, did he go into that situation knowing that he probably was going to die and willingly going into that situation? Or did he go into that situation naively not knowing what was going to happen? Yeah. That's like an awesome question. Uh, you guys, you were just, Ha! <laughs> Young person, how old are you? 13? Yeah? Ha! <laughs> I like it when you guys make us look even dumber than we are. <laughs> huh? It's good. It's important for our generation to remember our dumbness. Huh? <laughs> I think that that's a valuable question because of the way the book is organized. You know, This book is organized in a sense that it does a number of things, it's supposed to do a number of things, whether it does them effectively or not is really up to other people to decide. But one of the things that the book asks is that this book isn't really complete as a book, you know, until you as a reader answer certain questions. And I feel that this book becomes the book that you're reading when you answer those questions, and each person's book is very different. I mean, I feel like it's no accident that it's a novel about lost books, whether it's the book that Oscar mails home when he's on this quest and never gets back because of the Dominican mail system, whether it's the book that supposedly the grandfather Abelard wrote that somehow has been destroyed or maybe never existed, whether it's the book that Junior, the narrator, is trying to put together and he can't in the end because there's this final chapter that he realizes someone else has to write. Or it's the book in the final dreams where it's this empty book that this figure keeps holding up. you know. And in some ways, the book is asking you as a reader that you have to literally answer some questions. And once you answer them, the book organizes itself. And so if you say that you and your, if you say that Oscar went in knowing it, you have one kind of book in your hands. If you say that Oscar went into that final quest naively, you have a different kind of book in your hands. Yeah? 
And I feel like in some ways, that was my ode to the choose your own adventure books, you know? <laughs> Which no, I actually had that as a component of the book that it wasn't working. There was a couple places where if you believe that Oscar, you know, go to page 12 and it just sucked. Nobody liked it, so including myself, you know? And I thought that that was in incredibly, the reason that I, I like, you know, not just because of the perspective, perceptive question, but because in some way you're asking, do you know what book, when you, when you read this book, what ending do you have on it, you know? And my version of the book, of course, in my mind, not what I wrote, because what I wrote has all the possibilities. In my mind, I always hope and think and would argue that Oscar was aware of the dangers. But that doesn't mean shit, because there's enough evidence that Oscar is like a major, major dumbass, <laughs> you know? And I think the narrator is very uncertain. The narrator is very uncertain. Yeah. Just uh, one more question. I mean, I think, I don't know how much time we have left, but it's always better shorter than later, yeah? It's 7.59, so we've been at 45 minutes. Um, was there, uh, where's the mics of any form? They're up there. Oh, yes, that's right. I'm so sorry. It's okay. Um, I had a question about your use of Spanglish in your novels and whether you felt that it was something that uh, could possibly isolate the novel from certain audiences. Yeah. No, I, um... But no, it, it gets back to that question that, uh, look, guys, it gets, it's, a, it's actually a very useful question, and it gets back to the question this young man asked, you know? Um, look, one of the things about literature, we were talking this a little bit about in class. Um, look, in one way or another, most books program their readers, yeah? If you're reading literary fiction in a traditional form, the programming is very minor. You just got to learn your characters' names, kind of learn their sort of motivations, and that's it. Um, if you're reading genre fiction, the programming tends to be far more severe, where if you're reading like fantasy and science fiction, you have to learn the names of the alien races, you have to learn the names of the planet, you have to learn that in this planet, when it becomes night, everybody turns to a fucking vampire, you know? <laughs> No, but I mean that that's, I'm using it as a joke, but genre literature and people who enjoy genre literature, one of the things that they become accustomed to and look forward to is the programming of the book. The way the book programs you, it teaches you a bunch of things that you have to understand. And it's kind of a fun experience, yeah? I think that this book is organized around genre lines. It's not just using the genre stuff because it's a fun pyrotechnics, verbal pyrotechnics, because it's asking you, this book makes no sense if you don't let it program you. And it's not some sort of sinister body snatching thing, but that if you don't literally take the time to learn the, the codes of the book. And it's a very immigrant process, yeah? I mean, I think that the one argument that isn't made in the book about why Oscar loves genre so much you know, the book attempts to understand why Oscar loves genre is because when you're an immigrant, you have to let this world that you're now in program you to an extent. You have to learn its codes. You have to accept it no matter what, whether you're playing with it or resisting some of them. You've got to learn enough of that. And I think that um, sometimes as an immigrant, one be one one experience of being programmed from a society is enough. We never do it again. You know, some of us hate that. That's why we look at genre and we hate it. We don't want to learn the rules of a monster. You know, we don't want to know what kills a vampire or what hurts it in this book. We don't like that. But I feel that that programming is, whether we resist it or not, is a normative part of being human. That in the end, we have to learn, pick up all sorts of codes to, to proceed. You know, we have to like pick up, uh, maybe programming is the wrong word because people look at me like I'm crazy, you know, but you have to learn a whole set of codes. Yeah. And so I thought that, again, this book allows for readers who don't want to learn any of the Spanish or ask anybody any of the questions about what the nerd stuff is, you know. This book allows for 
a literary reading. In other words, a traditional literary reading where you don't step outside, you resist, you want to you want to leave the book with the same codes you started with kind of intact, maybe with an emotional experience, but nothing else. But it also invites a deep level of learning. It invites you to learn all these rules and all this kind of like a game. And for me, I didn't think that the Spanish was going to lock out a reader any more than the nerdish was going to do it. I think I belong and we belong to a society where Spanish, you know, raises people's hackles and people's comfort levels. You know, 800 years from now, from we're living in the new Aslan, Borinquen, people are going to be like, oh, Spanish? That's nothing but this nerdish language. That's why we're banning this book, you know? <laughs> Our, rev you know, and I, I do think that people get more stressed about the Spanish when, in fact, there's more nerdish in this book than anything. And the book actually makes no sense in some ways if you don't ask yourself some of the questions about the nerdishness of it. Yeah? Because, in fact, the book reveals its secret arguments not in the authoritative historical sections. I feel like that's like one of the biggest tricks of the book. It has these really authoritative footnotes that Dike teach you about Dominican history, even though the narrator keeps getting it all wrong. You know, it welcomes your desire for authoritative stories. But in fact, it's in the make believe section, which everybody sections, which everybody skips over that you the book actually makes its central arguments. Yeah. I mean, one of the things someone at a reading told me, and I don't mean to go on, but somebody at a reading, a young kid raised his hands and said, you know what? How many people do you think, Mr. Diaz, know that? The opening quote of the book that comes from Galactus, this character in a Fantastic Four comic, you know, how many people do you think know that Galactus is asking that question, what import a brief nameless lives, that part of the book? He's like, Galactus is asking that question of the character, the Watcher, who is the, the alter ego of the narrator. The narrator keeps saying, I'm the Watcher. And... While this makes no sense to y'all, if you actually, the, the nerds who understood this stuff, it actually changes the book, you know? And as someone else told me, they're like, well, another nerd was like, uh, you know, it's kind of clear that the four main characters are organized around the Fantastic Four. You don't hide it too much, you know? <laughs> you have like force fields and, you know, you describe these characters in specific ways. And they're like, well, my one question is, so you have these Fantastic Four characters. Um, what's Junior? <laughs> They're like, what's Junior? And I was like, well, what do you think? And he's like, well, we never actually meet any of the characters. They're all distilled through Junior. You know, like none of the characters we actually meet. Junior just pretends that you meet them. And he's like, there's a character in the Fantastic Four comics called the Super Scroll. And the Super Scroll is a character who takes on all the powers of the Fantastic Four. He literally has every single part of them he is. And this kid was like, I bet you you organized Junior as a, the Super Scroll. And that's why he's the secret villain of the book. <laughs> you know? And this was like a little nerd kid, you know. <laughs> now, the fact that this kid was correct <laughs> doesn't change much of anything. I mean... When I was writing this book, I literally, the junior sections were called Super Scroll 1, 2, and 3. Oh, that's hilarious. You know? But again, so much desperation is, l people want so much from the authoritative. But the thing with Oscar is that Oscar always believed that the genre was just as valuable. And I wanted this book to sort of be a tribute to that, you know? If you ignore the genre, the book escapes you. And what I've thought so far is the people who are being paid to review this book all of them have avo avoided the genre. They've None of them have asked, beyond just bells and whistles, is there anything about this that's doing work in the book? And I, I, I felt like that part of the book was very successful. Trujillo was alive and well by the end. You know? Just one question that's not about nerds and we're done. There was a hand up here. We'll take that if we can. 
Yes, but the mic's coming to you, madame. What writers influenced you and what writers do you like now? Oh, man, I, I hope all the great writers that I loved influenced me. So, you know, you're always like, I always answer this question. I'm always like, I hope Toni Morrison influenced me. <laughs> but I'm almost afraid that it was like Edgar Rice Burroughs, you know, who had the real impact, you know. Um, I, I, I read tremendously. Uh, I currently am absolutely obsessed with that Japanese writer, Natsuo Kirino. She has a new novel coming out called The Real World. She's a Japanese writer. They translated a couple of her novels here, a novel called Grotesque and a novel called Out. And both books are dynamite. I mean, Out is better than Grotesque, but they're both really, really good. Um, I'm obsessed with uh, a lot of young writers. I mean, I, I really think that fucking um, Colson Whitehead and Chris Abani and um, my contemporary and dear friend, Edwige Dantecat, I think that they're the most extraordinary, you know, writers like alive. Um, I read a lot of short fiction uh, there's a, a, a young science fiction writer. His name is Ted Chang, Chang, C-H-I-A-N-G. Wrote one of the most stupendous short story collections. If we didn't have such a bias against genre, this kid would have my job, you know? Which, not to say it's a good job, but fuck, <laughs> you know? The story of yours, the story of you and others, I think the collection's called. The, the, he's just remarkable.